Welcome to the ICMI 2020 talk by me, John Bailey, on the Justice for Men and Boys talk on the history of feminism at Cambridge University. In May 2019, the following video clip was filmed in Cambridge after a talk by members of Justice for Men and Boys. Okay, so I'm not showing off about this, but you can't really see what happens in this one or two second clip, so I'm going to show it again slowed down. How was this situation allowed to happen? What led up to this event? Well, in May 2019, I was seeing a lot of coverage about so-called controversial speakers being banned or deplatformed at UK universities. This included a talk by Justice for Men and Boys political party spokespeople Elizabeth Hobson and Mike Buchanan. Before hearing Mike and Elizabeth talk, I had been learning the truth about feminism. I'd watched the Red Pill movie and I'd listened to a few of Paul Elam's YouTube videos. I'd also seen many of Karen Strong's videos, but I wasn't particularly in the open about my anti-feminist values, and I certainly wouldn't have considered myself any kind of MRA. My son, who was only 16 at the time, was also interested in politics and wanted to hear the talk. So I booked two tickets and then watched some very odd events unfold. In the lead up to the talk, there was an orchestrated attempt by protesters to get the talk shut down. The Varsity, a university publication, reported on an op open letter signed by 240 academics and students demanding that the event was stopped. There were accusations that students were going to be put at risk from violence. So looking through the Varsity article, it talks about this open letter and goes on to say, Open letter calls for cancellation of anti-feminist groups meeting in Sidgwick. Justice for Men and Boys has a controversial record on gender issues. Or to translate, Justice for Men and Boys doesn't fit the conventional narrative of female victimhood. The Varsity warns readers that this article contains references to rape and shaming survivors. I believe this to be in reference to the title of an article on the Justice for Men and Boys website, 13 Reasons Women Lie About Being Raped. Personally, I would expect the publication for Cambridge University students would know the difference between a rape victim and someone that lies about being raped. There are no instances in the article about any rape victims being shamed. The letter calls for the event to be cancelled and failing that, asks for it to be moved to a non-departmental university venue so individuals can choose to be present at the time of the event. It argues that the event is not in line with the values and missions of the university especially our stated core value of freedom from discrimination. I fail to see how that a talk that highlights discrimination can be against the university's stated core value. The letter also states that previously Justice for Men and Boys has engaged in harassment of members of the university and there is a credible threat that members of the university will be subjugated to further harassment. In particular, the group is noted as having harassed student members, students members of staff and societies at Cambridge, including a number of Cambridge academics. This event exposes these individuals and others to the risk of further intimidation and physical harm. As I don't have any connection to the university, or for justice for men and boys, I would have been interested in seeing evidence of the so-called harassment and intimidation that these individuals are claiming to have happened rather than these unproven accusations. If anything, the contradictions and inc incongruency of the letter made me more determined to see for myself what Justice for Men and Boys was about. Thankfully, all the protesters managed to do was to get the venue changed to a hall that is still on university grounds. On the day of the event, I heard reports that some protesters, I assume Cambridge students, threw a milkshake at Mike Buchanan and his party. This led to the now infamous chase through Cambridge, where Natty, one of Mike's companions, managed to catch and restrain the milkshake tosser. Yeah, tosser. Please let go of this lady. Call the police. 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 Call the police.
As you can see, this strong, independent woman who felt entitled to assault a group of people sitting peacefully in a pub is being protected by men. I'm sure the irony escapes her. Now, when I arrived at the event, protesters were blocking the entrance and chanting, there are many more of us than there are of you, which seemed odd, as this implies that they are in a position of power rather than being oppressed. In this picture, Elizabeth Hobson is seen standing defiantly in the middle of the protesters. Seriously, what a total boss. Regardless of the protesters, my son and I were able to attend the talk. I was left wondering why anyone would feel this event should be stopped. The so-called controversial topics included the history of feminism. I understand why a feminist would oppose that, that segment of the talk as Elizabeth painted a picture of a movement based on lies and gynocentrism. But the event also discussed areas where men have legitimate issues, such as genital mutilation of male babies, fatherlessness, reproductive rights, education, employment, health care and domestic violence. In fact, I learned that there were 18 areas in UK law where men and boys are actively discriminated against. I still can't see why a talk on men's issues is seen as so controversial. That a talk by a relatively unknown political party caused such an outrage. The event even made the national news. The Guardian published an article with the headline, Cambridge University criticised for hosting anti-feminist group. They make no reference of the men's issues that were brought up by Mike and Elizabeth. On a more personal level, you've seen what at first glance looks like me lashing out at a young woman for no apparent reason. So what actually happened? Well, on leaving the venue, I followed the directions of the security guards. I was distracted and my son walked ahead of me. Whilst he was passing the protesters on his own, a very brave individual decided to verbally abuse him. He was jumping around Matthew, calling him all sorts of names and getting very close to assault, actually assaulting him. I walked up to the protester and demanded to know why he thought it was okay to abuse a minor. All I got was a torrent of abuse. There were several students blocking my path and it was at this point that I realised it was futile and I tried to leave the crowd. This is when I was assaulted and had an unknown liquid thrown over me. I reacted instinctively and lashed out and hit one of the protesters. I then pushed my way through the crowd and went to strike the person that had thrown the drink. I remember seeing a young woman and instinctively changed what would have been another punch to a shove. I was then grabbed from behind by several people. I was punched and kicked and had someone's arm wrapped around my throat. Fortunately, someone managed to pull me away from the crowd. Whilst this was happening, my son tried to come to my aid, but was assaulted by another protester. Remember, he was just 16 at the time. I had my phone recording the talk and had forgotten to switch it off. Unfortunately, most of the audio after leaving the venue is inaudible. However, you can hear my son describe what happened.
over and say, come on, this isn't the way it's like. Oh, it's big, man. Oh, no, 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 hang him up. I'm 16 for fuck's sake. And he's there, and he's getting off my face, head up here, screaming at me, calling me a wang, telling me that I'm a little shit and all this stuff. I mean, I actually shoved him off of me at one point, so I could smell his stinky breath. His stank of weed. Okay. Yeah, no, fine. But we're going through orange juice. Right? Oh, for fuck's sake. I'm sorry for swearing, but this is ridiculous. No, it's ridiculous. Where are we going? Anyway? I think it's up that way. Oh, great. Who's starting? What one of them? I'm an old friend. You know you're screaming out of my way. And you're like, ooh. Oh. And then I turn down this guy's off my face and I'm like, move out of the way. And then someone threw a drink at him, so I lashed when out. When I saw that you got a corner, I, I was straight over there, like, come on, we can leave this. This isn't the way it's right, you know, this isn't simple. Were you attacked by them? Yeah, I was attacked by them. So why exactly did they do to you? Well, because my son here is 16 years old, and yeah. they were getting up in his face, mm -hmm. intimidating him. So I said, no, to one, I said to one of them, do you realise you're intimidating a minor? Mm -hmm. And then I got surrounded, they wouldn't let me out. And someone threw a drink over me and I felt I had to defend myself. Well, okay. At this point I was wrestled into a corner where I thought I was going to get the shit kicked out. Then I got shot around by a big fat guy. Yeah, you should call the police. You contacted the police. Oh, yeah. 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 I reported the event to the police, and whilst waiting for them to attend, I met Mike, Elizabeth, Natty, and I think Ewan for the first time. Here and now, I challenged the students at Cambridge University to provide the full clip so we can really see what happened, instead of just the two seconds that show me in the worst possible light. I didn't see the film, but I know there was a longer clip uploaded to Twitter. It was taken down when commenters on the clip stated it looked like I was trying to escape an aggressive crowd. The tab have stated that they only used their two seconds of the clip to protect the identity of the protesters, even though they managed to blur all the faces of the protesters. They have edited the clip like this so that they can spin a story of innocent protesters and angry misogynist, anti-feminists or men's rights advocates. No care has been taken by them to check the validity of the story. Remember, at this time I wasn't an MRA. I was simply interested in a talk at Cambridge University. They are using the clip of me without taking the same care protect my, to protect my identity and certainly had no concern about any harm uh, this out of context clip could have had on me, my family or my career. This is demonstrated further with the biased questions they sent to Mike Buchanan when asking him for a statement. They write, if you could please respond to the following claims as soon as possible, I would be very grateful. One protester, who stood among a group of protesters through which several attendees decided to walk on their way out of the event, despite allegedly being asked to use a different exit so as to avoid the protesters, claimed that one male attendee became more and more aggressive as he passed through the crowd, and eventually tried to punch a male protester standing next to him. They could have reflected on the situation differently. For example, two attendees to the event claimed to have been harassed by aggressive protesters, which resulted in one attendee having a drink thrown over him and in the process of defending himself was assaulted by several individuals. It is reported that the other attendee was only 16 at the time of the alleged assault. They go on to ask, another protester claims to have witnessed a female protester being pushed aggressively against a wall by an attendee of the event, while one claims to have heard threats of sexual violence being directed towards the female protester. An alternative take could have been, do you think the attendee reacted appropriately when he pushed the female protester that allegedly threw a drink over him? Their third question really shows their bias particularly as all of the questions and statements are from the protesters and none from the attendees. 
One protester said that the alleged aggressive targeting and online harassment of students by Justice for Men and Boys supporters prior to the event gave good reason to suspect that they might act with violence towards the protesters and women on campus. They could have made their own statement, maybe something like, there is little evidence of online harassment for supporters of Justice for Men and Boys. That, however, the tab has received comments from the protesters using the alleged harassment as evidence that Justice for Men and Boys shouldn't have been allowed to speak at the Cambridge University. Do you feel this is fair? They finally asked, Are concerns about the well-being and safety of students and staff, which had been repeatedly raised prior to the Justice for Men and Boys event being hosted by the university, proved absolutely founded following the events, said one protester. The reality is more than a little different. For the real story, they could have asked, do you think that Justice for Men and Boys, its supporters and interested parties have been unfairly targeted before, during and after the talk at the university? Now, I know how naive my musings about the tab may sound. So, moving on, I'll answer their original questions from my perspective. On leaving the event, I followed the instructions that I was given by the security guards. My son and I were both verbally and physically assaulted by Cambridge University students. My son and I were visitors to the university and we were exposed to violent protesters with women, as you can see here, holding signs saying milkshake those misogynists. It was the protesters that instigated the violence on the day. It was the protesters that instigated the violence before the event. And it was the protesters that harassed people online after the event. I contacted the university to raise my concerns about the conduct of the students on university grounds. Part of their response reads as follows. Regarding the university's own disciplinary regulations, I note that it would not be possible for someone not a member of the university to bring a complaint under those regulations. However, the university proctors have several duties which include ensuring good order and discipline within the university. Okay. Where were the proctors? How did they protect the visitors going to the university? I believe that my son and I were let down by Cambridge University proctors during and after the event. Any visitor invited to one of their properties deserves respect and there must be a moral and legal duty to protect visitors. So what happened next? I had no idea that my adventure hadn't finished. The level of interest in the event and my experience increased. Initially, I was concerned that the Out of Context video clip was going to be used as evidence against me. On social media there was a lot of noise from the woman that had thrown the drink over me, claiming that the police were going to press charges. I was also trying to get the police to take action against some of the protesters. I was told by the police that these charming women weren't actually inciting violence by holding posters saying milkshake the misogynists even though that's what happened to Mike and co and I had a liquid thrown over me. I was invited onto Honey Badger Radio and was interviewed by Brian Martinez. If I remember correctly, it was after the interview that Brian extended an invitation from Mike Buchanan to go to the International Convention for Men's Issues 2019 in Chicago. Initially I wondered how this was going to be possible, but Mike reached out to the amazing MRA community by organising a GoFundMe campaign. The response was outstanding. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone that donated money so that someone that they had never met could fly to Chicago to attend the ICMI 2019. Thank you very much, I'm deeply touched. I do wonder how that horrid drink-throwing feminist would feel if she knew her actions had led to me being flown to Chicago and spending an amazing few days with icons like Karen Strong and the grand misogynist Paul Elam. I also ended up rubbing shoulders with free speech advocates like Count Dankula, as well as meeting many other wonderful people. One of the talks that has stuck with me was Count Dankula's talk about freedom of speech. He made reference to a Russian comedian's joke where he discusses 300 Russians being arrested for comments they've made on social media. And in contrast to that, the 3,000 people that are arrested in the UK for making comments on social media. This situation is only set to get worse. And the problem is it's not even being applied consistently. As you had Count Dankula's joke that saw him, saw his life turned upside down 
and dragged through the through the British courts for making a joke that involved his pug. Whereas Ricky Gervais, a very successful comedian, has made a very, very similar joke on national TV going out on um, his programme Afterlife, or his comedy Afterlife, where he plays a journalist that is sent to a couple's house to interview them and take photographs of them together with their infant that they have chosen to dress up as Hitler. Now that was incredibly funny, but the same joke that Count Dankula made, and Ricky Gervais ends up probably winning awards for, for making that, that kind of jokes. In a recent article published on the BBC website, the headline is Misogyny. Women should be protected under hate crime laws. We then have a long article that's discussing why women need to be a protected group and that misogyny now is to be considered a hate crime, which means that anyone found guilty is not only going to be prosecuted for sexist comments or sexist behaviour, but as a hate crime, their sentences can be much, much longer. In the article, there's a quote from Chief Inspector Louise Clark, who leads the hate crime unit at the, at the Nottinghamshire Police Force. She said that they have taken numerous action against perpetrators, and even where there was not sufficient evidence to support a prosecution, officers have spoken to men about their behaviour and explained the consequences. They've explained the consequences of committing a crime of which it cannot be proven because there's not enough evidence. Surely there's no crime that has been committed then. The issue was debated in Parliament's second debating chamber in 2018. The then Minister, Victoria Atkins, replying to the debate, said the government needed to be careful when creating new laws that would inadvertently conflict with the principles of equality. She said, Equality of prosecution is, crucial, is a crucial element of ensuring public support for hate crime legislation. In other words, if we were to have hate crime in relation to gender, we would have to think carefully about whether that would apply to the entire population or just half of it. So at least there is some will from the government to make sure that men aren't unfairly singled out. However, personally, I don't believe that that's actually going to win through at the end of the day. I think this law is going to go through and that misogyny is going to be seen as a hate crime and misandry is not a crime at all. I also watched the film American Circumcision by the documentary maker Brendan Marotta. In the trailer, the film shows a tray of medical equipment including scalpels, needles and clamps. There's a long shot of a device used to restrain infants where they're strapped down by the limbs to hold them still for the circumcision. You then see an infant boy being strapped down and a voiceover asks, is this what we want to be doing as parents? Is this what parenting looks like? I've since talked with various people about circumcision and one of the biggest challenges I hear is, yes, but female genital mutilation is worse. I still find it hard to accept or understand why that is even relevant. FMG is rightly illegal. And why should cutting off bits of a baby boy be compared with cutting bits off a baby girl? Both are disgusting and both should be stopped immediately. And on this, I just want to talk about my hope for the future. My son is doing an A-level in sociology. As part of the course, his teacher asked the class, do the major religions use FMG to control women? To which my son answered, the real issue in Abrahamic religions is male circumcision, which is seen as acceptable and routinely practiced. This took his teacher by surprise. I don't think she'd been challenged in this way before. She tried to downplay Matt's comment in stating that circumcision isn't as bad as FMG. Matthew asked her why she referred to male circumcision and female genital mutilation. It was at this point that the teacher decided they needed to move on in the discussion. My hope is that young men like Matthew are waking up to the feminist narrative and are beginning to turn their backs on it. I'm also seeing more evidence of a change in perception about domestic violence. Recently, I saw a programme being trialled by Deborah Powney. She was part of a team that raised £4,000 to run a domestic violence support service designed for male victims. Here is a quote from their GoFundMe page. We have achieved ethical clearance to conduct a 12-week pilot study in the Lake District in the UK. The study will examine a theory that a group of men that have been victims of partner violence or abuse and are suffering from such negative effects as anxiety, depression and PTSD are best placed to help each other. 
on their path to recovery by using social support, peer mentoring, peer mentoring and the benefits of nature. The study will consist of a series of four walks in the Lake District. The first will be an introduction to mountain hiking where the participants will be shown how to navigate and map read before starting their introductory walk. To ensure everyone is at a comfortable skill level for the programme, concluding with scaling Scarfell Pike, England's highest mountain. So it is by talking to our children and by supporting initiatives such as these that will help to turn the tide against feminism and address the balance needed to ensure that men's issues are taken seriously. I am sure attendees to last year's event will remember Alison's talk. She made the analogy that various social media platforms are the equivalent of the four rides of the apocalypse. Twitter being the place for angry people wanting to fight. Now, Twitter was my platform of choice to challenge feminists in the misguided belief that I'll be able to change minds and win the good fight. Like many people this year, I've had the, have had a long time to think and reevaluate. Part of my journey has been the discovery of the law of attraction. The law of attraction is the belief that positive or negative thoughts bring positive or negative experiences into a person's life. An example, the universe hears your wishes and delivers them to you. If you constantly want more money, the universe will deliver that to you. That is, the feeling that you want more money. If you fight against something, the universe only hears that you want to fight something. On Twitter, if you fight feminists, you will find many more opportunities to fight feminists. And what does this really achieve? In the long run, it is tiring and self-defeating. Now, I'm not saying that feminism shouldn't be fought, but we can't all be Cassie James or have the skills and legal knowledge of the late Mark Andalucci. But we can look for opportunities to support programmes designed to help men, either by donating to them so they can increase the work they do, or we can highlight the work they are doing to support men so that there is more awareness of what is available and what is possible. If there's any truth to the law of attraction, the more we can focus on the positive work being done to support men, the more good works will manifest. If we can support the good works that are being done, the programmes that are helping male victims of domestic abuse, the experiences of the men that have been helped, and the stories they will tell others, or in fact the stories that their families will be able to share, will have a far greater impact than any tweet or Facebook comment that you or I can put out there. So instead of fighting feminism, let's start supporting men. Start supporting the programmes that are helping men and get feminists to fight against those programmes. Get them to show their true colours. Get them to show their misandry. So this conference, this virtual conference, has been a little bit different from last year. So I was surprised and flattered to be invited to speak at this year's event. It's certainly not something that I've ever done before. There are so many people working on men's rights across the world and so many stories of the injustices that men are suffering that make my experiences with feminism hardly worth mentioning. So in closing, I'd like to thank Mike Buchanan and everyone at Honey Badger Radio and all of the good people that I met at Chicago for making me feel so welcome in this wonderful community. I hope that when we get some normality back in the world, that events like the 2019 conference can take place again. I'd love to be able to join the likes of Paul Elam to smoke another excellent cigar or join a group going to Hooters for another round of chicken wings and beer. We really, really did try and go through too many chicken wings. So until we can all meet again, thank you for listening to this talk. And thank you to the protesters at Cambridge University, because without them, I wouldn't have had this journey and I wouldn't have met such amazing people. So, one final time, here, it all here is where it all started. <laughs>